Now let's talk about Polish politics contemporaneously. In October, October 25th, 2015, the largest mandate, popular mandate from the Polish people uh, with a voter turnout of 50%, which is about Derrigor, slightly over 50%, which is slightly above average. Uh, it's sad that that engagement is not higher, and it's actually gone down over the last several years. I know that in 2010 it was higher. Uh, they voted in the right of center opposition Law and Justice, Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, with a unilateral mandate to govern. This was the first time since 1989 that one party received this unilateral mandate. There was no need for a coalition government. In previous years, uh, even PO, uh, the Eurocentric party, uh, they called themselves center-right. I always joke, the only thing center-right about them is the side of the road their taxpayer-funded chauffeurs drove them on. There was nothing center-right about Platform Road Vitelska. Uh, they were also socialistic, uh, they were statist, they were Eurocentric, uh, and mostly uh, their philosophy was just used as cover to loot. Uh, when they would say that they were going to lower taxes, like they did in 2010, uh, there was a snap election, uh, there was a promise that we would lower taxes. I was in Sopot, uh, actually during a uh, a rally where all of the, the PO people were, Sikorsky, Komorowski, um, and the promise was to lower taxes. This was a couple weeks before the election. The election's on a Sunday. That Monday they raised the bat. Uh, you know, I'm not always a defender of all economic policy emanating from the <coughs> right of center socialistic party that now Poland has, but I know they act in good faith, and when they say they're going to raise taxes, they raise taxes. And that visibility as an investor, that's the kind of visibility that the global investor class needs to do business. <coughs> Blindsiding uh, the global investor class with regulations that are promised won't materialize, or tax cuts that are uh, the opposite of what does materialize, is a way to chase a foreign direct investment out of the country. And that is something that has started to accelerate the last few years leading into this last election. The shale gas drilling is a great example. Poland was supposed to be a center for shale gas drilling. Uh, it's arguable whether there is huge shale deposits uh, underground, but regardless, uh, sh uh, Shell, uh, Marathon, BP, Eni, Total, they would have spent hundreds of millions and billions of dollars creating jobs just in exploration. But the last government, given their culture of looting, was more interested in short-term licenses, one-year licenses with uh, renewals, with no visibility on what the renewal rate would be, and confiscatory royalty rates should anything be unearthed. So they chased away a huge potential economic driver to GDP growth. Again, with or without the shale, the job creation in the ancillary industries beyond the, the exploration companies would have been massive. Hundreds of thousands of jobs would have been created. Uh, so, going back to October 25th, we had this incredible mandate after the people of Poland, many of whom had known and talked about it, and called political culture has been such, it's political culture of post-communism, which means essentially the same figures before, flipped to capitalists, crony capitalists, in transition post-1989. They wrote a constitution. Uh, I've read the constitution, it's not a very good constitution. It needs lots of reform, and that's where the tribunal debate comes in, which we'll get to. Uh, this class did a huge amount of damage to faith in government in a people that it really was hungry for freedom. It's not a, it's not a coincidence that Poland led the way uh, in fighting for its freedom uh, in the 80s with Solidarność, uh, with the transition in 89. Uh, Poland was a big precursor uh, to the death of communism. Uh, Glasnost and Perestroika, of course, helped soften things and allowed there to be a critical mass of energy uh, that could do things like protest and communicate to the greater world. Uh, and Poland was the first, and the people were hungry to make it the best. And as I wrote about the coming recession in Forbes, it didn't work out that way. And I contend that a Fedotashmova, the cake scandal, really drove the level of the mandate that was given popularly to the new government. Uh, Warsaw, people in Warsaw, people connected to the political class or within arm's length or visible, uh, a visible position of what was going on uh, with the political class knew about the corruption. But after Herr Tashmova, there's nobody 
who didn't realize the scale of the corruption. This was institutionalized looting. I joke with my partner about uh, Chicago and Illinois that if anything happens for the good of the people, it is entirely by accident. And this is really what was happening in Poland the last several years. Uh, given this mandate, and also it's important to note that in May, simple majority, Andrzej Duda became the president. Uh, so you had a peace, a law and justice president, and you had a unilateral mandate in the legislature from law and justice to govern, and people were looking for post-communist reform. They'd been looking for it for years. They'd been sold a false bill of goods many times by, by PO, uh, and PO had a coalition partner. Uh, PO's coalition partner was PSL. Uh, I call them in most of my writing the Marxist Farmer Party. Uh, they are the agrarians, and as I become a journalist, uh, I've gotten more than a uh, symptomatic, more than a representative sample of whistleblowers who tell me that when there's an election, I should come and watch the way PSL manipulates voting. PSL, given they have the morality and they control the jobs in things like schools in smaller towns and in, in the rural areas, industrial farms and factories that are state-owned, they stand over the shoulders of those who would vote and say you vote PSL or you lose your job and it keeps them at 5% present in the parliament uh, and certainly in excess of 3% funded from the treasury. And so this was a natural coalition partner for PO. The irony is that PO called themselves center-right and here they are with the Marxist farmers who have ties to communism. The fourth large party that existed up until recently was SLD, uh, SLD which was the closest uh, sort of iteration and connected party to PRL. They had the party Leszek Miller, who was a communist, uh, a proud card carrying communist for many years. And interestingly, uh, this got a lot of press globally, that in this election, SLD did not get enough votes to maintain a presence in the parliament. And Rosam, a sort of youthful oriented Marxist party, did not get enough votes. So a lot of the mainstream global media suggested that the left, the far left, the Marxist left, had been pushed out in this voting cycle. Not totally true, PSL still existed, and I would argue that PO still existed, and then we have some new iterations, which I'll get to shortly. So this mandate was unprecedented. The presidency and the executive branch, the legislature without coalition, and the third branch was the judiciary. And a lot of the, the reason why we're all here to discuss this is because I think that most people sitting here believe uh, a, in Poland as a great country, a great society, a place where honest government needs to take hold. And this government and the country has been maligned with more antipathy than any free electoral outcome government has ever seen, at least in my view. Uh, by October 26th, uh, Radoslav Sikorsky was on CNN saying that the only reason that Law and Justice won was a fluke of electoral politics because of the fragmentation across multiple parties, totally undermining the fact that with a 50 plus percent voter turnout, uh, they received enough votes to have a unilateral majority uh, and govern unilaterally without coalition. Um, so the level of media spin because, and my, my, my reasoning, my belief in the reasonings behind this, beyond the simple spoil system self-interest of vanquished looters, I call them the vanquished looter political class, uh, now being excised from the political debate with no power, no ability to engage the patronage spoil system, which they had so successfully made work for them for so many years and on an accelerated basis up until this recent election, uh, this was being referred to as a fascist coup in American political dog whistle parlance. Nationalists, populists, xenophobes, bigots. Now, I believe that there were two main reasons that Law and Justice won with such a mandate. One is what I've been talking about, the corruption, and the other is Poles are very independent-minded. After so many hundreds of years and so many iterative, oppressive tyrannies, they want freedom, and they've watched Brussels expand to such a degree that it is impediment to their freedom. It worked very well for the political class. It worked very well for the MEPs and their families. Uh, the joke is that Donald Tusk uh, is the greatest example of an immigrant and an expatriate looking to milk the Brussels teat. He got his Brussels corner office. 
and a larger, he was the lowest paid head of state. Now he's doing quite well. His clothing allowances are quite magnificent. Uh, so it was these two factors, the corruption and the Brussels level of impeding Polish democracy that people saw more and more and more. For many years, more Europe seemed like a good idea. More Europe was a counterweight to Russia. I love Daniel Kaczynski. He's one of my favorite people. We agree on everything, but I do see in Poland a healthy distrust of Russia, and pure diplomacy will not... We, it's the one thing we disagree It's the one thing we disagree on. How to handle Russia. How to handle Russia. Well, I'm, I'm working on you. Um, <laughs> uh, but more Europe seemed like a good idea because Poland has been carved up and left to swing uh, in 1939 and then 1945, and more Europe seemed like a sensible idea for security. But as Brussels has expanded its sphere of influence beyond supranationally, but also into everybody's garden and into everybody's pocketbook and into the curvature of everyone's pickles uh, and all sorts of utterly ludicrous regulation, and Poles are very independent minded. Uh, you know, you, I, it's not a coincidence that my father and I are Poles. He tells us to do something. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to argue with you. Uh, we're going to complain about it, certainly. Uh, so it really came to an accelerated head uh, during the migrant crisis. Poland is 99 plus percent Polish Roman Catholic. As a Polish Jew who has no real spiritual connection to the Catholic Church, I consistently suggest that Poland's strength and its ability to maintain its freedom-minded zeitgeist exists because the church is such a strong center of values and for hundreds of years under oppressive periods it was the repository of such values and Polish culture. In every Soviet, Soviet uh, satellite that got uh, sucked into the Iron Curtain, the priests were brought into the middle of the square and shot, and many countries, Czech Republic being a great example, said say la vie. In Poland, they fought. They fought because the church meant something greater. It meant something greater than a spiritual center. It was also a social center, a civic center, a philosophical center. My father's favorite philosophers, uh, at least sort of pre-enlightened philosophers, uh, were uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, Augustine. And it was that intellectual zeitgeist that drove him. He actually converted to Catholicism and joined uh, to go to Nikopov Chechny and wrote for the Catholic Press. And it wasn't a coincidence, that was the Catholic Press and the heavy connection that Poles had to the church that the Soviets could not break from their grasp, uh, that it was such a repository of values and Polish uh, honor, history, culture. Uh, so Poles being 99% plus Roman Catholic, seeing the forced incursion and injection uh, of the third world, Muslim world, uh, saying from Brussels, you have to accept these people into your midst, Poles, having had to fight to maintain their culture and to now continue to carve it out in the late 20th and early 21st century, rejected this, wholly rejected this, especially after seeing empirically it doesn't work. So when you've got countries like Germany married to this project, and in a in my own view, it is their rational self-interest to introduce a low-skill, low-wage labor force. Uh, Poles do not need that. Uh, Poles have, thanks to the post-communist looter class, not enough job opportunity. You can see it walking the streets of London with how many Poles are in London, uh, sadly. Uh, that job growth has not picked up. I argue economically that job growth uh, is so hindered because government has grown so much, not just Brussels, but Warsaw. Uh, a, a funny stat that Jarosław Gowin, who was the first politician I supported publicly when he formed Polska Razem, a socially conservative, uh, economically liberal uh, uh, party, uh, he would <coughs> cite the stat that there were more uh, people working for the government than under PRL by a very large margin, whether by direct employ or by contract. Everybody was working for the government, and that is a problem because that crowds out the productive, the entrepreneurial, and the competitive. Uh, government workers are generally not the most competitive workers in the workforce. Uh, when you look at in 2000 versus 2014, most of the staffs in the SEM, obviously of course Brussels as well, 
expanded dramatically. one of the things that i just learned today is that every mp has two or three staffers. that is kind of an inspiration to me because that is certainly not the case in warsaw, brussels or or the united states. ah so going back to this mandate ah as you can see i just start going off on tangents the executive branch, the legislative branch and that left the judiciary. so let's talk about the judiciary so the pinnacle of the judiciary, the the tip of the spear of the judiciary, the polish version of the supreme court, though i argue with people who say that that's a very analogous term, they do have different roles ah is the constitutional tribunal. a little history on the constitutional tribunal it was brainchild in nineteen eighty two, it was launched in nineteen eighty six during the height of glasnost and perestroika and it was staffed with communists. from the very beginning it was a potemkin village kangaroo court to show the west we are liberalizing the staff turnover at the constitutional tribunal, nine year terms, was very low coming into this election cycle, fourteen out of fifteen of these so called jurists were appointed by po or psl they were loyal to the last government and hyper politicized, many of them with communist backgrounds themselves like treplinsky, the head of the constitutional tribunal so you've got a judiciary that's supposed to be the arbiter of constitutionality, who's overseeing a highly flawed constitution written by communists for communists during transition a transition that in nineteen eighty nine, i think probably a lot of people here know about magdalenka and the round table ah lech walesa, who i am not a fan of i do believe that it's a very good thing. transparency breeds accountability, breeds truth, breeds light, breeds justice ah and exposing lech walesa's history as a operative of the communist party. i've got to know a lot of people, i have some great friendships of of real solidarity members not members of solidarity who were very late to the party right as the whole communist prl was crumbling and then said hey we're opposition, which was many people in po but people who were in jail with cornell memorjewski who was who was exiled and fought his way back into the country or friends especially in wrocław who were interned for six months real oppositionist hard liners and they've got great stories on lech walesa, seeing what he was doing agent bolek is not a construct of the polish right this is more and more being factually proven and he made a deal with the communists and the power sharing was rather off kilter seventy percent of seats post round table went to communists, thirty percent went to oppositionists, many of them lech walesa's guys and that was who helped poland transition into a quote unquote democracy so you've got people, and i always say that poland will only be truly great when those who were educated in these systems of power utilization are gone and that includes a lot of oppositionists who are not innately bad people but they learned in their formative years of exercising power and engaging power, political power and legislative power they learned from a poison system and it's only when they exit stage left or stage right, depending on their perspectives that poland can really assert itself as a robust democracy because the people believe in robust democracy the codification is very very flawed. in nineteen eighty eight there was a law called wilczek's law that experimented with allowing people to be entrepreneurs and it was a it was a revelation babcias and jadeks created stores out of nothing old people who were previously essentially serfs to the communist regime were all of a sudden creating businesses where they were creating products for domestic consumption and export and wilczek's law essentially reversed the standing law which was if something is not permitted it's illegal wilczek's law said if something is not expressly illegal it's permitted, much closer to the american laboratory of innovation this is what allows for innovation we've actually tried to institute a new wilczek's law but given the polish political class on all sides they argue about who's going to take the media on it so we haven't gotten very far on it but it is very very necessary and this is the kind of example of the constitutional flaws that exist in its present state this tribunal run by communists on october eighth it was october ninth there was a legislative fix to change the rules of ascension onto the tribunal there was going to be two jurists whose terms would be up after the election, the end of the year and 
legislatively, the still PO majority voted to disallow that term expiration and accelerate the process to right then, at that moment. And they then installed new justices. There were several justices whose terms were up, who they installed, and then there were two who they accelerated the process in an effort to prevent the judici judiciary from migrating over the natural term of, uh, of uh, justices' terms being up and peace now having the appointments. So they were fighting to make sure that this quote unquote independent judiciary that they go all over the uh, Western press saying uh, is an independent uh, judiciary. And they put in new guys, and then after the new government was formed, they reversed this. They nullified the, all, all five appointments, and their claim was to pr bring a semblance of balance. Uh, in addition, they changed the, the order of which cases were heard, as the ju judiciary had proven that this was not an honest independent ju judiciary. So instead of allowing the, uh, the triage system of hearing cases, they said they were going to do it in a more neutral manner, which is chronologically. So instead of giving the Chief Justice Szaplinski the discretion to hear cases at his will, they said we're going to do it chronologically. They put in, they abrogated the, uh, those justices that they put in. They put in their guys and they changed the, uh, the voting from a simple majority or a, a quorum to a large majority that PO and the last judiciary did not have. And that's when attacks started, some of the attacks. And so as I've, I've argued that, and this is, I write about this all the time, there has been no coverage in the fact pattern of the tribunal in the BBC, in CNN, in the Washington Post, in the New York Times, in the Associated Press, uh, in the FT, in The Economist, uh, and it's important to note that The Economist, the uh, Poland correspondent, uh, Central and Eastern European correspondent, a guy named Ed Lucas, very close friends with Robert Bob Sikorsky and Ann Applebaum. Uh, Henry Foy is an aficionado of their work as well. He's the journalist for the FT. At no point do any of these outlets and any of the hundreds of other mainstream outlets with generally a Eurocentric agenda to centralize power to the technocratic elite, at no point do they mention that the bench was stacked three weeks before the election. They just don't mention it. And that is an integral fact that is curated out of the fact pattern and has colored the entire global perspective on Poland and bolsters their thesis that these democratic elections are a fascist coup. Uh, there was also, secondarily to the tribunal, a media law. And that, that's the main other point where they've used to justify their quote-unquote fascist coup narrative. The media law said that instead of the KRIT, a uh, uh, assemblage of bureaucrats that are long-term appointments who appoint the heads of the public media, the treasury who pays the bill would appoint the heads of the media. And the reason they want to do this is because if anybody who's been to Poland the last few years knows is that this media is like Pravda. It is outright propaganda. It's no peace politician got a fair shake during the election cycle. They did not get TV time. Uh, and so peace wanted to reverse this. And again, this is the public sector media paid for by taxpayers that just selected a new government, not the private media. At no point has the private media uh, been touched in any way beyond advertising, state-owned enterprise advertising being canceled from those who have been ideological enemies of the government, like Isidro Borcha, who lied and did not exercise their mandate as an organ of the press. Uh, the irony is that at the same time as this media uh, debate is going on, Germany is censoring everything. They will not report the news, even if that reporting of the news helps save lives, or at the very least helps save young women from being sexually assaulted by a class of people from the third world who do not understand post-enlightenment gender values. Uh, and in addition, they also have make overtures to Turkey's uh, Erdogan for EU ascension uh, in some sort of Faustian bargain to control borders, Erdogan has shut down private media, has imprisoned journalists, has arguably killed some journalists, and is no friend of free speech or free expression. So the irony of having the EU and Timmermans, Ettinger, and Schultz go after this Polish government for abrogating a free press is laughable. And Bianca Schiegel, to her credit, in Strasbourg, very simply made the case that pretty much every country in Europe has a similar mechanism as Poland is now trying to institute. A new government installs the public sector media heads, uh, whether it's direct or indirect. Uh, Belgium is very direct. 
Poland, they wanted to make it very direct, well within their mandate, given the honesty and integrity of the previous media. One other anecdote about the coverage, the news coverage, that uh, Sikorsky and Applebaum helped perpetuate in the West. The former defense minister, a odious fellow named Tomasz Szymoniak, uh, he bolted in the staff of a NATO-affiliated office, a liaison office that helped do things like put studies together of defense spending. He wrote this narrative. Uh, he wrote that uh, that changing the security service, changing the heads of the security service, is proof that this government's firing the civil service. Show me a country that when a new government comes in, especially a starkly opposed government to the last government comes in, they allow the heads of things like internal and external security to remain. Especially in Poland, where it has not been a secret that it has had huge Russian intervention behind the scenes in helping determine what the defense strategy is. And PO, all too happy to spend very little on defense, they would prefer to spend the money on themselves, all too happy to take EU grants for roads and spend the money on themselves, uh, really did care. And so it was not a secret to most uh, close watchers that these defense services were filled with legacy communists as well as Russian spies. And there was even uh, validation that Simoniak's team was doing business under the table with KGB and FSB, uh, FSB uh, being the, uh, the new KGB, uh, their operatives, and even weapons sales and purchases. Uh, certainly not something good for the safety and sanctity of the Polish nation. Uh, one other Jackson Deal uh, special, and this is a guy who knows nothing about Poland, uh, so it, I think it was pretty much ghostwritten by Anne Applebaum, was that the defense minister, Antony Macerewicz, is an outspoken anti-Semite. Those are the words, I, I can't even make that up. And I speak in hyperbole, but outspoken anti-Semite. I know Antony Macerewicz. He is not an outspoken anti-Semite. Moreover, in 1968, he marched against the purging of Jews from students and universities, the students from the universities. Uh, and this dated back to a radio interview he did questioning uh, the, the validity as well as the potential uh, correct assertions, you know, just questioning the protocols of the elders of Zion. This was in 1980 and the transcript is somewhat incomplete. And so this is proof he's now spoken anti-Semite. Uh, and that is another weaponized narrative mechanism they use to undermine this government. There was a, a, a Broadway style prop and effigy in Wrocław of a Hasid that was burned in front of a rally of young nationalist ONR. Now I've got no affinity for ONR. I think they're thugs and heathen, but they did not organize a burning of an effigy of a Jew. One unaffiliated 55 year old rabble rouser who's pretty well known as somebody with unsavory ties was in all likelihood given a case of Juber a prop and said, go out there, wait till Gazette of Abortion is filming, and burn this thing. Incidentally, that footage with Gazette of Abortion's logoing made it onto CNN on Fareed Zakaria's segment about the new fascist coup in Poland, Poland's uh, uh, direct uh, descent away from democracy. Fareed Zakaria, a very good friend of Rostov Sikorsky, they give each other uh, lots of credit on their book jackets. Uh, so you've got this whole cabal of internationalists, Euro Eurocentrists, media elite, uh, who are pushing this narrative. And mostly, even it even goes to the U.S. politicians. Dick Durbin, uh, Senator of Illinois, uh, uh, Ben Cardin, Senator of Maryland, and uh, John McCain, uh, neoconservative war hawk senator from Arizona, who's been funded for 30 years by uh, heavy defense industry. Uh, they wrote a letter about the fascist coup narrative. It just so happens that Rostov Sikorsky uh, uh, gave John McCain an award at First Web Global Forum a few years ago. Uh, Dick Durbin is very far left and of the same milieu of centralized power, whether that's Washington, D.C., the United Nations, Brussels, or Davos, Council of Foreign Relations. They all have a similar zeitgeist, and they are at war with what they call nationalism and populism. Nationalism is a very healthy dynamic. Without it, there's no patriotism, and you've got Germany. Uh, populism is the will of the people. How they've made that into a dirty word is absolutely criminal. Uh, you know, they usually attach nationalist and, hate and uh, populist to xenophobic, bigot, racist, Nazi, hate monger, that kind of thing. So they make those connections. Uh, two other side points I want to make. Uh, one's very important. Opposition movements sprung up in November after the Constitutional Tribunal. 
called KOD, Committed Obroni Domokshutsi. It is run by a game, guy named Matyush Kiyotsky, at least as a figurehead who runs it. Matyush Kiyotsky is a criminal. He has not paid child support in years. He is deeply in arrears. Uh, he looks like an aging hippie beatnik. Uh, he operates KOD originally out of, I'm guessing, his mother's garage. Uh, and recently I proved that it was funded by George Soros. We all kind of expected it from the beginning. Again, Open Society Foundation is dedicated to open society. They term it, it is on their website, a society of easy migration and a ultimately one world government where the technocratic elite run everything and culture and nationalist borders are really, really in the way. KOD is funded by George Soros. There was no transparency in it. Uh, I did a sort of operation with a, another nonprofit that I work with called Project Veritas, where we attempted to go undercover and prove it. Unfortunately, the operation was uh, got a little facade, and we uh, we ended up getting anyway. We ended up getting the, the incontrovertible proof we needed because a New Yorker article was written about me and uh, James O'Keefe, the head of this organization who I serve on the board of. Uh, that we screwed up so badly, but in the end, their Open Society Foundation spokesperson says, we do not fund the opposition, but what we do fund is civic groups on the ground uh, that are protecting democracy, which is under assault in Poland today. So that was a pure admission. I've been all over Polish television uh, alerting people to this fact. Uh, and one other point on KOD is that though it is not a political party, and the reason they are not a political party uh, is because they want to be able to work with groups like Open Society or Freedom House in Washington, D.C., a human rights organization, kind of like Human Rights Watch or Amnesty International, who Kiyovsky went to the U.S. the same exact time Andre Duda went to the U.S. for high-profile meetings with uh, those who would be uh, sympathetic to this assault on democracy narrative. I went to Freedom House wearing an undercover camera, asking what's going on with this Kiyosuke meeting, and they had no idea what I was talking about. So this was smoke and mirrors perpetuated by his of Borsha, and that group that is looking to undermine the government, uh, because they have worked with the other guys. One other new political party sprung up, who works very closely, and by the way, KOD rallies are like political rallies. You've got two main political parties ubiquitous. Uh, you've got PL, of course, and you've got Nova Chesna. Nova Chesna PL is supposedly the new economically liberal party run by a former banker shill consultant named Richard Petru, who in a real demonstration of his character, first, he's an economic liberal who all his book sales are bought by the last government, his books were subsidized heavily by the government, uh, but more telling was he was being paid by the banks and consulting firms and accounting firms to push Polish mortgage holders to swap their mortgages into Swiss francs from Polish Slotty. Uh, when I was in college, I worked at Bank of America on a swaps desk, interest rate and cross-currency swaps. I can tell you from experience, there is no higher margin transaction that a bank can do than an interest rate or currency swap. You offload all risk into the market the second you get the order, boom, push enter, and you have a free fee. So he was being paid to push that. It came out that he was flipping his mortgage back to Polish slot. And obviously after the revaluation, um, Last year, it was, uh, or earlier this year, it was uh, very, very painful for a huge amount of Polish mortgage holders, so much so that I believe in the coming quarters, you're just going to start to see a GDP headwind from lower household consumption because of the magnitude of the capital that is now on the hook to go to international banks for mortgage holders. So this is your economic liberal who's fighting for freedom and democracy in Poland. His name is Ryszard Petru. Uh, luckily, he makes a fool of himself every time you give him a mic. Uh, so he's not, uh, you know, there's not much critical mass. Unfortunately, I do predict that Donald Tusk will come back to Poland and merge Kio and Nova Chesna, uh, and they might be more viable than as an opposition. Uh, we shall see. Uh, of course, I have much more to say, but I've been told about 15 minutes ago I should shut the hell up. <laughs>